I'm Valerie Williams, registered dietitian, and I'm here today to talk with you about refeeding syndrome. For all you practitioners out there, you're probably familiar with refeeding syndrome and assess your patients for it often, and may also help with the prevention and treatment. But for you students out there, it might be hard to imagine seeing this in your daily practice. But you will imagine you're working on the floor and you're asked to see a patient who hasn't been eating for two weeks due to dysphagia and poor appetite, and they wanna start nutrition support on that patient. And you wanna get them up to speed as fast as possible because they wanna send them out to a rehab. So you think, let's get nutrition started. But wait, you first need to think about what is refeeding syndrome and how do we assess for it, prevent it, and intervene if it does occur. Let's talk it through. Uh, so what is refeeding syndrome? It is a range of metabolic and electrolyte alterations that occur with the reintroduction or increased provision of calories after a period of decreased or absent calorie intake. While it can occur with the reintroduction of oral intake, it is more commonly associated with nutrition support, including enteral and parenteral nutrition. This refeeding syndrome is typically seen within hours to days of calorie provision. Throughout this video, we are going to be referencing Aspen Consensus Recommendations for Refeeding Syndrome that were published in 2020. And they define refeeding syndrome as a measurable reduction in levels of one or any combination of phosphorus, potassium, and or magnesium, or the manifestation of thiamine deficiency developing shortly, which is hours to days, after initiation of calorie provision, to an individual who's been exposed to a substantial period of undernourishment. So the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome is important to understand, but first we need to look at what happens in the setting of starvation or nutrition deprivation. So during extended periods of nutrition deprivation, survival depends on the ability for the body to efficiently use and preserve available energy stores. This results in vitamin and intracellular electrolyte depletion over time. But serum electrolyte levels may remain normal despite overall depletion in the body. The abnormalities related to refeeding syndrome are caused when you, by increased use of nutrients for carbohydrate metabolism when you introduce nutrition. When glucose appears in the bloodstream, insulin secretion rises, and then this can result in a drop of serum electrolyte concentrations. For instance, insulin pushes phosphorus and potassium intercellularly, which results in decreased serum levels that you may see in refeeding syndrome. So what are the signs and symptoms of refeeding syndrome? Historically, we think of the historic hallmark sign of low serum phosphorus level. But refeeding is more than a low serum phosphorus level. It can also result in low serum levels of other electrolytes, in including potassium and magnesium. Additionally, hyperglycemia and thiamine deficiency. Refeeding syndrome is an important topic because if it is left unaddressed or uncontrolled, it can lead to organ dysfunction um, or even death, rarely, uh, especially in severe refeeding syndrome. And so that can lead to things like fluid retention, cardiovascular conditions, such as arrhythmias, hypotension, heart failure, and cardiac arrest, neurological conditions, including weakness, numbness, and vertigo, and respiratory conditions such as shortness of breath, pulmonary edema, and respiratory failure. So you can see with the severity of these organ dysfunctions and severe refeeding syndrome, why it's so important to identify prevent and treat refeeding syndrome. So how do we identify patients at risk for refeeding syndrome? This is a short list of um, qualities to look for that may lead to increased risk of refeeding syndrome. I also recommend that you refer to the Aspen consensus recommendations for refeeding syndrome as there's comprehensive tables for criteria to identify patients at refeeding risk in both the adult and pediatric populations. So first is low body mass index, followed by significant weight loss. Additionally, low caloric intake, especially prolonged low caloric intake, abnormal pre-feeding potassium, phosphorus, or magnesium levels, 
loss of subcutaneous fat or muscle, and higher risk comorbidities, which we'll talk about here in a moment. So commonly associated diseases and conditions are numerous. I um, named some of the more common issues here, including failure to thrive, protein malnourishment, major stressors or surgery without nutrition for a prolonged time, post-bariatric surgery, cancer, dysphagia and esophageal dysmotility, advanced neurologic impairment, food insecurity and homelessness, prolonged fasting, eating disorders, and chronic alcohol or drug use disorder. And this is just to name a few. Um, comprehensive list is available in the consensus. So what are the interventions? And really for refeeding syndrome, we focus on identifying refeeding syndrome risk and avoiding it. But if it does occur, despite our best efforts, then we focus on treatment. And so first let's talk about calorie initiation. When you're thinking of calorie initiation and advancement, you wanna think start low and go slow so that you're starting with a small amount of nutrition and slowly advancing it over several days. So as you initiate, you wanna start with low levels of glucose or total calorie provision with gradual advancement as appropriate. For adults, you want to initiate with 100 to 150 grams of dextrose for parenteral nutrition or dextrose containing intravenous hydration or 10 to 20 calories per kilogram for the first 24 hours. You can then advance by 33% of the goal every one to two days. Now keep in mind that this recommendation may need to be personalized for your patient and their overall condition. Additionally, you want to include in your calculations all sources of glucose. And so that could be from nutrition, hydration, and medications. Next, you move on to electrolytes. Um, you want to recommend obtaining serum, magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium levels before starting nutrition. That way you have a baseline to measure what degree of change has occurred as you've started the nutrition. Um, you also want to make sure when you're recommending labs that you don't use general statements such as monitor patients' labs. Be sure in your recommendations to identify what labs you would like to have monitored and how often. You also want to, to recommend planned and periodic monitoring of levels as feedings advance. Ideally, every 12 hours for the first three days in patients at high risk for refeeding syndrome. And lastly, you wanna recommend repletion of electrolytes as needed. And if you're noticing low electrolytes that you don't feel have been addressed, don't be afraid to mention to the team how important the repletion of electrolytes are in this population. I think my teams probably think I'm a squeaky wheel uh, because I'm always messaging about checking and then repleting those electrolytes. Next, we have thiamine. Thiamine is very important when you begin feeding a patient. Um, the thiamine demand greatly increases during the transition from starvation to fed due to its role as a cofactor for glucose-dependent metabolic pathways. In a patient at risk for refeeding syndrome, you want to recommend supplemental thiamine before feeding or providing dextrose-containing intravenous fluid. And so that recommendation is typically a 100 milligram dose. You can consider longer thiamine supplementation in patients at high risk for refeeding or with signs of thiamine deficiency. Uh, typically, the recommendation is 100 milligrams a day for five to seven days. And then lastly, keep in mind that routine thiamine levels and checking those levels is unlikely to be of value in this setting. Next, we move on to multivitamin. And so you want to be sure to add a complete multivitamin or to be providing a multivitamin in the parenteral nutrition solution unless contraindicated. Um, and that multivitamin should be provided for in the enteral or oral setting for 10 days or more based on clinical status and mode of therapy. And then lastly, monitoring um, is key to early identification of refeeding syndrome. Recommend in the inpatient setting, checking vital signs every four hours for the first 24 hours of nutrition initiation. Also daily weights and monitored intake and output. And then lastly, recommend planned periodic monitoring of those serum electrolytes as feeding advances. 
And that's something that you can help to provide that recommendation for how often those should be checked. Right, so let's wrap up this video with a discussion regarding the role of the registered dietitian nutritionist in the identification, prevention, and treatment of refeeding syndrome. So first, you wanna be sure that you're assessing for and identifying patients at risk for refeeding syndrome. Do not be shy and be sure to inform the team of refeeding risk and necessary steps for prevention and intervention if refeeding syndrome does occur. Next, you want to recommend initiating nutrition support at a low rate with a gradual advancement. Don't, be, don't forget to consider all sources of calories and fluid in your calculations. Next, be sure to recommend frequent lab monitoring of magnesium, phosphorus, and potassium serum levels with repletion as needed. Also, be specific in your recommendations in regards to what labs you want to obtain. And lastly, be an advocate for appropriate interventions and monitoring. Keep in mind that refeeding syndrome may not be on most clinicians' radar, um, but as RDN, it is our role to help identify refeeding risk and advocate for the patient to receive appropriate prevention and treatment of refeeding syndrome. Thank you so much for joining me today, and we look forward to seeing you in the future at our next video. Mm -hmm.